And I thank you, Carl, for that more than generous introduction. I'm delighted to be back here at the Bird Center. Um, he mentioned the 1989 um, society meeting. Uh, that meeting was also when Senator Bird won the Henry Adams Prize for the first volume of his uh, magisterial history of the Senate. And I was terrified to be in the room with the sitting <laughs> senator. I remember just shaking. Uh, he has missed greatly since uh, he has died, and we are very fortunate to, to be able to be here. It's also an honor uh, to give this lecture, named after Roger Trask, a federal historian who devoted much energy to encouraging and structuring the Society for History and the Federal Government. One of the most vivid memories I have of Roger, one that impressed me about his commitment to the importance of this society, occurred in 1996 with the publication of his history of what was then known as the General Accounting Office. He dedicated the book to the officials and staff of the GAO, past and present, and to my close friends and colleagues in the Society for History and the Federal Government. Roger valued the associations with other SHFG members and set a standard for participation in the society that we all should emulate. To launch this year's program then, Across the Great Divide, Historical Research in a Digital World, I want to look at the history of the digital age, survey what's happened in these few decades, and suggest what special skills and obligations we bring to the future of federal history in the digital age. Let's begin with the recent history of the computer and the internet as they have changed our ways of communicating historical scholarship. In 1979, when I began my PhD program in American history at Emory University, I bought a portable typewriter similar to this one to use for research papers. But I had also I had just learned from a secondary school colleague about something new. This was a computerized typesetting machine, and I learned my first keystroke, Control-C, would send a command. That typewriter gathered dust because Emory had just expanded its data processing computer from running payroll exclusively to include a rudimentary text editor accessible to faculty and students. It had, we were told with great pride, a whopping three megabytes of storage capacity. I also signed up as the very first history graduate student to take a computer language as a second language. Since no one had done this before, we created from whole cloth the series of classes that qualified. I studied BASIC, Baby Fortran, and a language called PL1, Programming Language 1. And I managed to write simple programs such as this, having the computer ask for input and print words, including the input. I learned two things about computers that have helped me in my career more than any other foreign language would have. First, I gained a knowledge about how the machines work and what could be expected of them, and what power, power was the big word in 1979, what power they held to correct mistakes without retyping an entire page, a tiny segment of their real power but one very important at that moment to the very poor typist that I was. Second, I learned that I could get hooked trying to solve a simple programming task and spend hours determined that a mere machine would not beat me. In 1979, a key aspect of graduate training 
was using quantification in historical research. And I will return to this subject uh, a bit later in this talk. At Emory, we were taught to use the statistical package for the social sciences, SPSS, which required inputs in Fortran for punch cards that were then compiled and run on Emory's mainframe computer and produced only the simplest of graphs. One misplaced semicolon in the Fortran input could cause the program to crash. It teaches you to be a very careful editor. To earn money one summer, I wrote a simplified manual for historians faced suddenly uh, with these new machines, but without the computer training that I had taken. It was called a cookbook approach to SPSS, and it sought to convey in the most simple and clear language I could muster how to deal with the new technology. Looking back, I view this effort also as a clue to my interest in writing for a public audience instead of solely an arcane language uh, for those already conversant in a subject. In 1981, IBM introduced the personal computer, which required uh, software on a floppy disk inserted into a drive called A drive and a blank formatted disk uh, to hold user created files in a file called uh, B drive, a drive called B drive. In 1983, a 10 megabyte hard drive was also available, somewhat obviously called the C drive. I was sure this would be the last computer I would ever need. Who could possibly use more than 10 megabytes of storage space? Of course, this was just the beginning because for those of us using the computer primarily for word processing, we needed only black and white paper and ink simulators, and couldn't imagine why any more might be needed. Although the details of the meeting where I heard this now escape me, at some gathering in 1993, the next phase in the digital revolution, the World Wide Web, was brought home to me. A senior archivist, if I recall correctly, from the National Archives told whatever group this was, with wonder in her voice that she had recently viewed something called a mosaic browser and had seen the future. <laughs> mosaic was software, of course, that permitted the transmission of images. Wow! For historians, images meant that all sorts of photos and maps and drawings could now be made available to the public to enhance our written text. The next year, MIT doctoral candidate Judith Donath introduced something called the electronic postcard. She was astonished at how much people liked it and attributed it to their need uh, in a hectic life to stay in touch without having to write a long letter, another prescient view of digital life that today has come to mean 140 character conversations. <laughs> By this time, at my agency, the National Institutes of Health, I was primed to embrace any sort of digital help in responding to historical inquiries. With the assistance of NIH's fine medical arts and photography department, we proudly uploaded www.history.nih.gov in 1996. As you can see, at this point, we were still emphasizing the Stetton Museum, the segment of the office around which it had originally been organized, with a history office added on to make up enough work to justify hiring one full-time person. As that person, I was happy to be able to post basic NIH history uh, information and information about the multiple institutes on a public website to which I could direct people without having to type and retype the same information. In addition, I wanted to share the exhibits we were doing with a broader public. The first exhibit on our website featured work on the, the work of Marshall Nirenberg, the United scientist who broke the genetic code and was the first federal scientist to win a Nobel Prize. Once Michelle Lyons uh, had joined me, she worked on an exhibit about the link computer, the first computer uh, that scientists uh, could have in their own laboratories for analyzing data as opposed to uh, one single mainframe computer for everybody to use. As you can see in both these examples, our initial efforts were heavy on text and light on images. 
That changed over time. Our society similarly adopted digital communication via the web as early as 1996. Here is the very first SHFG website. As it was being developed, I also remember executive council discussions about when it might be appropriate to save money on printed communications and use email instead, given that SHFG members spanned the paper digital divide and some strongly resisted having anything to do with computers. Throughout the next two decades, the F SHFG website evolved alongside the rest of the web. Here's the 1999 version, which featured a dark background and more color. The 2008 version, which stepped back the contrast a bit. And the version that's been in place since 2011, which puts lots of information for the viewer right up front. We all know from these initial small steps that the internet has grown to dominate many, if not all, aspects of our lives. The federal government began slowly and then gained momentum in making first information available to citizens and then online forms and then downloading forms or submitting forms uh, and with other uh, digital conveniences. One may now uh, file tax returns online download travel information from the State Department, the health, health information from the CDC about companies, countries one plans to visit, view high-definition renderings of art from the Smithsonian Museums, and communicate with the White House and Congress. With this revolution, of course, uh, there have been those who resisted the transition and many missteps in the execution of the digital transition. The recent criticism of the Library of Congress as slipping behind in worldwide leadership for lack of human leadership on the issue is one example. The slow pace of electronic records management at the National Archives, admittedly a daunting task given the variety of agency records in various digital forms and classification statuses is another. The recent flap over lost emails at the IRS and Hillary Clinton's use of a private server for government business has focused attention on what to many Americans would seem to be a simple process of bringing all government email under one system. What the public doesn't understand about federal email is the size of government, the development of email systems for individual agencies by private contractors to meet specific needs the instability of some agency servers, and the human need to get federal business done while not connected to a government email account. In a completely unscientific survey of federal, fellow federal employees, which admittedly did not include anyone from the CIA, NSA, or other highly restricted agency, I found not a single person who had never used his or her home email for sending work messages. In fact, many said they used their home email because their work servers would go down, or they couldn't access work servers from home, or they had other problems but needed to get federal business done. For historians, the power of the internet to reach public audiences can now be coupled with the power of analytical data programs to, li uh, to mine large data sets. In 1994, the late Roy Rosenzweig founded the Center for History and New Media, now named after Rosenzweig, at George Mason University. His aim was to develop and promote the use of computers for humanists. The Rosenzweig Center developed widely used tools such as Zotero for bibliography and note taking. That camp, uh, the movement, that standing for the humanities and technology with the camp representing informal conferences at which humanists can learn, share, and move forward with studies involving technology. The Rosenzweig Center has also compiled digital archives, including the September 11th Digital Archive, the Hurricane Digital Memory Bank, and the papers of the War Department, 1784 to 1800. In 2004, my office at NIH collaborated with the Rosenzweig Center on a 
on Carl's favorite digital exhibit about the development of the home pregnancy test, the research for which was conducted uh, at NIH. We wanted to make it possible for viewers to share their own stories about the test, but as a federal agency, NIH could not create a public database because of Privacy Act provisions. Being private, however, uh, the Rosenzweig Center could create and store the database, so we simply inserted a link. I don't know if you can read the text there, but uh, telling viewers that they were being transferred to a site outside the government if they wanted to read an account of their own story, uh, to, um, to leave an account of their own story, or read other people's stories. The American Historical Association, the Organization of American Historians, and other umbrella professional societies have also fostered the growth of large-scale digital history. The advantages of digital history, for example, were discussed in an OAH interchange in 2008. For military historians, there are exceptionally rich digital resources. As one graduate student at Northwestern put it, quote, military history is very data driven and the military keeps lots of records. Similarly, other historians are developing databases to study the American Foreign Service. Here's one that permits analysis of diplomacy from 1775 to 1825. There's even one on the Digital National Security Archive, one I'm sure we could all enjoy browsing. There are summer workshops where historians can learn to use digital data, and there are calls uh, for collaborative research guidelines for which as late as 2008, the American Historical Association said that no collaboration guidelines were needed because, quote, historians did not collaborate. <laughs> I would now uh, like to return to my earlier mention of statistics and historical research and take a look at the impact of this aspect of his digital history on our profession. Until World War II, traditional historical narratives of political, military, and even economic history, uh, many of which historians working for or in the federal government had been deeply involved in preparing, had been grounded in the reading and interpretation of whatever sources individual scholars could access. After World War II, some scholars began to question the traditional narratives. They hoped to use data from election returns, demographic data, and the like to analyze political and economic history. The so-called new economic history debuted in 1958 with the publication in the Journal of Political Economy titled The Economics of Slavery in the Antebellum South by economists Alfred Conrad and John Meyer, in which they argued that slavery would have continued without the Civil War. This issue was brought to national attention in 1974 with the publication of Time on the Cross, The Economics of American Negro Slavery by Robert William Fogel and Stanley Ingerman. This book was one of the hottest texts when I entered my PhD program in 1979. By applying statistical methods from the social sciences to history, they were creating a new technique that they called cleometrics. And in 1993, Fogel shared the Nobel Prize in economics for his work. Meanwhile, in the 1960s, other historians utilized statistical methods with large quantities of data to write about the lives of common people, and with them, the new social history was born. From the French Annales School, uh, whose adherents uh, analyzed medieval and early modern history through the study of parish records, to the American scholars who wanted to tell the stories of immigrants, racial groups, and industrial workers, women, and other previously undocumented groups. Historians mined data and produced books that stressed analysis over narrative. It also led to the fragmentation of the field and a focus by practitioners aiming their work at smaller and smaller audiences of their peers instead of at a broader public. Speaking in some hyperbole, the historian Herbert Gutmann wrote in 1976 that, quote, 
A biography of an Irish-born Catholic female Fall River, Massachusetts textile worker and union organizer involved in the disorderly 1875 strike would require nine different specialized substudies. One critic of the results also described historians as now writing defensively, not fluidly. And another said that we sounded as if we wrote with our elbows. <laughs> Educated potential readers often put such books aside because they required a great deal of intellectual work to wade through. Instead, they turned to journalists who explained the ideas in more accessible language. Critics of cleometrics and other statistically based scholarship weighed in early. Perhaps most famous was Carl Breidenbaugh who in his presidential address to the American Historical Association in 1962 argued that, quote, the finest historians will not be those who can succumb to the dehumanizing methods of social sciences, whatever their uses and values, which I hasten to acknowledge. Nor will the historian worship at, that sh at the shrine of that bitch goddess quantification. The emphasis was in the original. Breidenbaugh has primarily been remembered for this outburst and consigned to the category of historical dinosaur. But in that same address, he also observed that with more and more scholars employing all the tools and techniques, using all the data processing machines, and the, also those frightening projected scanning devices, which are to, we are told will read documents and books for us, there is still no machine for digesting the sources. The training we receive as historians, I would emphasize, should teach us not only to analyze and interpret our sources, which is something that we can do specially, but also to communicate it in a publicly accessible manner. As for the responsibility of historians to provide context for current political debates, scholars have also differed strongly. Some believed that historians should play a major role in influencing current policy decisions. Others argued just as strongly that this was futile and an arrogant pretense, that history could never point the way to the correct decision for a politician. Ernest May argued in his 1953 book, Lessons of the Past, the Use and Misuse of History in American Foreign Policy, that, quote, if history is to be better used in government, nothing is more important than that professional historians discover the means of addressing directly, succinctly, and promptly the needs of people who govern. Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., in contrast to his own later active involvement with the Kennedy administration, countered May's argument in his review of May's book, stating his belief that, quote, it may well be more important for professional historians to write the best professional history they can and trust to the multiplier effect. The memory of the U.S. government misleading the public about the Vietnam War the campus riots for free speech and against that war, with all the destructiveness associated with the riots, had a chilling effect on the historical profession. Many historians wanted the profession to, uh, to go on record against various government actions. In his 1991 AHA presidential address, William Luchtenberg described his opposition to such actions. Quote, I would no more want to inflict my views on others than to have their views inflicted on me, nor would I wish to see us torn apart by factional fights over such issues. He went on to say, quote, I hope never again to witness a night like the one at the AHA convention in 1969, when historians grappled with one another for control of the microphone during the bitter debate over resolutions on Vietnam and civil rights, with AHA President C. Van Woodward, in the words of the New Republic, presiding over the cacophony with the puzzled air of a kindly Southern judge at a hearing for psychiatric commitment. <laughs> 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 
Also in the 1970s came the brouhaha of a highly publicized court case invo involving the hiring policies of Sears Roebuck and Company with respect to women and men as salespeople for large appliances. Female historians testified for both the plaintiff and the defense arguing different cases for whether women aspired to such specialized job opportunities. I remember this case as extremely divisive within the nascent Coordinating Committee on Women Historians. It also led one writer to assert that all expert witnesses were whores. <laughs> These experience, I, experiences, I believed, produced a generation of academic historians who often cast government as inherently bad in all situations, whether or not they had facts to support their arguments. I also believe that this view colored academic historians' view of their colleagues who worked in federal agencies or who produced histories on contract. Both were viewed as inherently tainted court historians. It was easier for academic historians to turn inward, to pursue the ever narrower subcategories of social history, emphasizing methodology, writing for the handful of their peers who shared their interests. Since they also trained the next generation of historians, however, their views came to emphasize a tenured academic career as the goal, the place historians could freely criticize power without consequences and carve their own specialized niche in the historical research edifice. Public history was something not well understood and often viewed as public relations with a glaze of scholarship, a consolation prize if you weren't able to secure a tenure track job. This produced the heartbreaking situation of rigorously trained young historians who feel their failures because the uh, tight academic job market left them without the desired academic position. What I find peculiar about this response from professional historians is the fact that all these same issues came up in other social science disciplines. The economists, political scientists, anthropologists, and others similarly experienced internal quarrels, but their response through professional societies was never to withdraw from the public sphere. As Lochtenberg also noted with respect to a proposal in the late 1970s to create a council of historians, to advise national policymakers, quote, it will be objected that history is not as technically refined a subject as economics and that historians diverge widely in their views. But it has also been said that if all the economists in the world were laid end to end, they would still reach no conclusion. <laughs> Yet the Council of Economic Advisors has proven to be a constructive innovation. The professional landscape for the humanities and social sciences in the United States today then looks uh, like this. Social scientists are vigorously supporting jobs for their graduates in academia, the private sector, and government. Within the humanities, both philosophy and English support subfields that provide jobs outside of academia. Philosophy major can become a bioethicist for a hospital or a government um, agency. Uh, or uh, uh, English majors, uh, I'm sorry, English majors who don't want to teach have two options. They can pursue a career in journalism or become professional writers. They can write novels, nonfiction, become technical writers, or become editors. History alone seems has lagged in support for its graduates to enter the private and government sectors. Since 1979, the public history movement, including our society, has worked diligently to open jobs for historians outside of academia. For historians working in the federal government, I want to ask, what should we be doing? Uh, what should we be doing for our agencies? Should we uh, advise on policy decisions? At my agency, political scientists have monopolized the policy analyst function and do not seek or welcome historical input. 
Because of this, I took the position that the function of my office uh, would be to help the institutes document their own histories and communicate to the American public what NIH had accomplished with their tax dollars. Historical materials about NIH that my office produced have become foundational off, um, documents for many of the institutes, yet history at NIH is still viewed as a non-essential luxury. And as a historian trained to want references to primary sources, I was horrified to see the very simple website that I wrote a long time ago called A Short History of NIH, cited in NIH's Wikipedia entry as the major historical reference. The digital revolution, however, has opened doors to making more nuanced scholarship available on the web. And the Office of NIH History is now uploading as much public domain scholarship about NIH as possible. So what more do we all need to do? And how can digital scholarship help us do that? My answer is advocacy, starting with simply making sure our websites reflect the scholarly contributions of our offices. I would also like to see the creation of more interagency personnel uh, agreements, IPAs, that would offer current graduate school faculty the opportunity to gain experience in the public realm or in private sector historical contracting to help remove the subtle bias against non-academic history and to give them experiences that they can actually talk about as they educate their students about non-academic opportunities that could await them. As many of us as possible should become Wikipedia ed editors to help ensure that the history portion of our agency's uh, entries adequately uh, reflect historical scholarship about them. This is one of my to-do items to try to get correct that entry on the NIH. We should also make an effort to get major federal history projects featured in Wikipedia since it is now such an essential source and work to get more distinguished members of our society recognized with biographical Wikipedia entries. For those of us who are retired and have the luxury of owning our own time, volunteering in advocacy positions can also pay dividends. I volunteer as the Washington representative for the History of Science Society. I read all those policy-related emails that full-time employees don't have time to read, and I can forward to the HSS executive director uh, those relating to legislation affecting our membership or opportunities uh, to get members appointed to federal ex uh, advisory boards. I also represented the History of Science Society at meetings uh, in Washington of the Consortium of, of Social Science Associations and the National Humanities Alliance, and I came to appreciate how much more active the social scientists are in advocacy for their members than humanists have been. And of course, having spent my entire career at NIH, I was very much aware of the exceedingly strong advocacy groups supporting biomedical research funding. Thinking about longer term, term goals, I would like to see our society work towards investing in a seat on the National History Coalition's policy board. An expensive undertaking, but one with potentially important payoffs for the initiation of new federal history offices and the preservation of existing ones. I would also like to see society members in partnership with the National History Coal uh, Co Coalition, the AHA and the OAH, make another attempt to get legislation through Congress or an executive order mandating historical offices in every agency. SHFG should continue to make partnerships as Carl described earlier, for mutual benefit with subject area societies. For example, one result of the SHFG History of Science um, Society partnership, the History of Science Society recently specified in its long-term plan that partnering with us was a priority goal within its own advocacy efforts. 
My bottom line here is the belief that if historians are going to re-enter the public sphere in a significant way, we must learn to press our case more strongly. The most heartening aspect of this new advocacy is that much of it is coming from the newest minted historians themselves. They've taken to Twitter and other online forums to communicate and pass along work opportunities more quickly than traditional media will permit. Finally, I want to say we need to support digital archives with our donations. The Wayback Machine, which serves as the Internet's archive, provides a mean to archive web pages that we now cite in our publications. Uh, this is what I'm pointing to on that slide, so that they will still be available when future readers search for them. And because of this, this is especially deserving of our support. We must do this because much of the web will disappear if we don't. You may recall that Google hoped to become the new library at Alexandria, hosting all the world's books and websites. Copyright lawsuits over Google Books demonstrated that this goal might be unachievable, and just this year, Google's board of directors decided to abandon that as a corporate goal. And immediately this meme reminding us that no matter how good their intentions, corporations are business enterprise, enterprises subject to change with the people who run them, and that libraries and archives will be the only reliable repositories because preserving knowledge and making it available to the public is the sole reason they exist. We must link our efforts with our umbrella historical societies, and fortunately, the American Historical Association is currently headed by Dr. Vicki Ruiz, an academic historian with experience in public history, who clearly gets it about work outside academia. I have quoted many other AHA presidents in this talk, and I'd like to close with Dr. Ruiz's message of support to the members of SHFG. On behalf of the leadership, professional staff, and over 14,000 members of the American Historical Association, I write to send our warmest greetings to our colleagues in the Society for History and the Federal Government. As historians, we are all, quote, activists in the, for the archives, unquote, and we salute the efforts of all of you in the service of history in the federal government. At my university, like those across the country, the emphasis has turned to big science and big data, <coughs> with in some quarters the unfortunate consequence of devaluing the humanities and social sciences, including history. I am reminded of the poster, scientists can create a Tyrannosaurus Rex, but historians can tell you why that might not be such a good idea. <laughs> Those who consider history only in the past tense fail to recognize the importance of historical context and meanings to our present and to our future. I don't have to tell members of this audience that we do so at our peril. You stand on the front lines of historical knowledge, preservation, and archival ad advocacy, and we are all grateful to you for that work. I would bring to your attention a panel on Saturday afternoon chaired by Emily Swafford, Programs Manager for the American Historical Association, entitled On Being a Historian For Versus a Historian Of the relationship between historians and their agencies. Emily, you don't get a better plug for your session. <laughs> this roundtable will address current challenges and provide a space for dialogue and collaboration. As a university-based historian who has participated in over 70 public history projects over the course of my career, I deeply appreciate the practitioners as well as the practice of history in the public sphere. But I do not speak only for myself, Career diversity for graduate students and the National History Center are vital AHA initiatives, and we welcome more robust partnerships with the Society for History and the Federal Government. We wish you a productive and rewarding conference. I join Dr. Ruiz in wishing us all a rewarding annual meeting, and I thank you once again for the opportunity to present this Trask Lecture.